This year, 2015, is the bicentenary of the Battle of Waterloo and various museums and galleries up and down the country are commemorating this battle in one way or the other. Um, and here in Plymouth, we have a particular, particular connection with the battle because Napoleon was brought to Plymouth Sound um, and remained in the Sound for about a week um, prior to his exile to the island of St Helena. Um, now, Plymouth Museum have put on this ex exhibition here that you can see. It's titled Fallen Emperor. Um, it's on between May and September. And that's being staged at the Museum and Art Gallery. And um, I went along to have a look at it a week or so ago and um, wasn't given permission to film inside the exhibition itself other than um, a very kind of broad panning sweep of the of the display um, which I had to settle for um, but the whole uh, subject has captured my interest and I've been wandering around Plymouth trying to take film of the various places that are related to this incident and um, it's raised quite a lot of uh, questions in my mind that I want to discuss with you over the course of this film. So this is the gallery. Um, the reason I wasn't allowed to film was that there were certain items that have been loaned to the gallery and they don't own the copyright on those artifacts but um, unfortunately there were some things that really um, I would have liked to have put in this film including a, a little piece of the wallpaper from the um, Napoleon's room at Longfield House on St Helena and that wallpaper um, has been um, it's been suggested that the green colouring in the wallpaper, which in those days contained arsenic, um, seeped out of the wallpaper in the humid conditions of the island and was a contributory factor in Napoleon's death. And they certainly did find uh, traces of arsenic in his hair when his body was returned to France in 1840. Um, so he had certainly um, ingested arsenic in one way or the other, but whether that was in sufficient quantities to kill him or not is a still a matter of some controversy. But the probability is that he died of stomach cancer um, because he was demonstrating all the symptoms of that on his death. But he did have a great deal of lassitude and headaches and that kind of thing which might have been attributable to arsenic poisoning. Now the exhibition is centred around this painting which is in the possession of uh, Plymouth Art Museum and Gallery and it's by a French painter called uh, Jules Girardet who wasn't even born until 1856 um, so he probably painted this around 1890 something like that um, long after the events that he's describing and um, Plymouth Museum purchased it in 1909 and have had it ever since. So after the defeat at Waterloo which was on the 18th of June, 1815. Uh, Napoleon returned to Paris. And the first question in my mind is, did he actually abdicate when he returned to Paris? Um, the, the accompanying um, brochure that's on sale in the museum in, in Plymouth says, says that he did. Um, I have my doubts. It's, it's certainly in 1814, um, 
he abdicated prior to his exile to Elba. But um, as we'll see, he demanded really that um, he be treated as a head of state when he was in captivity. And he couldn't have done that if he had abdicated that second time. So that's the first um, matter of contention, really. I, 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 I don't know the answer. Um, I just raise it for your um, interest and uh, discussion. But anyway, soon after um, he arrived in Paris, he left again and he fled westwards. And his object seems to have been to get to the French coast and to board a ship and attempt to um, escape to the United States. And this would have been a logical thing for him to do because uh, not only France but also the United States had until recently been at war with Britain and of course um, the United States was a young country in those days. It had, in living memory, fought a war of independence um, and gained its freedom from Britain. And the French had been um, instrumental in, in helping and aiding that um, revolution. And uh, there would have been a lot of natural sympathy and allies within the United States and Napoleon would have um, found sanctuary there. But this wasn't to be because the British were um, imposing a tight naval blockade around the coast of France and Napoleon eventually was obliged to surrender um, to a Captain Maitland who was the captain of this ship that you can see in this painting, the Bellerophon, which was a 74 gun ship of the line, so a second rate ship of the line in the British Navy and it had had a very distinguished uh, career up until then, which I'll talk about a little bit later in this film. Um, but anyway, he, he surrendered and this is where the sub this the matter first raises its um, head of whether or not he surrendered as a simple general or as head of state. Um, Maitland always insists that he he took his surrender as a general, um, and that is important um, because it has a sort of legal bearing on the way that Napoleon was subsequently treated. But it's interesting to note um, that whenever he came up on deck on, on the Bellerophon, he, um, the officers always doffed their caps. They always, they always took their, their hats off while he was on deck, um, which was a mark of respect only afforded to monarchs and heads of state. Now, there are a number of reasons why Napoleon's capture was something of an embarrassment to the British, and I'm going to go into that as well in more detail later. Um, but uh, it was evident right from the start that uh, Maitland had a little bit of a hot potato in his hands, and um, the Bellerophon returned to Britain and made land off just off of Tor Bay um, on the 24th of July, which was a Monday. And he was ordered uh, to keep his distance basically from the shore, not to take on provisions. And a messenger was sent to the Admiralty informing them of Napoleon's presence on board. Um, but they were desperate to try and keep this matter a secret from uh, the general population of Britain. Um, and they 
failed miserably in that attempt because uh, the sailors on board the Bellerophon uh, swiftly leaked the news of Napoleon's presence on board um, by throwing messages overboard in bottles and so on. And very soon there was a large crowd of um, sightseers beginning to congregate in small boats around the Bellerophon. And after two days, Maitland was, was ordered to sail and make his way to Plymouth and anchor in the Sound in Plymouth. But by the time he arrived in Plymouth, um, the news that he had Napoleon on board had preceded him and uh, he had even more of a problem in Plymouth Sound um, because people were actually flocking um, down to Plymouth in order to catch a glimpse of Napoleon. So the next thing I'd like to discuss is where exactly in Plymouth Sound did the Bellerophon anchor? Now, as I've said, this painting was painted many, many years after the event. So can we rely on it as any kind of indication of the precise spot where the Bellerophon was anchored? Um, it, is, it is accurate in terms of its depiction of the land around the sound. Um, there's not just water there, there's a little bit of land in the distance. And uh, just make a mental note of the shape of that land because that does portray um, a piece of land called Mount Edgecombe, which is on the north side of, sorry, beg on the west side of the sound um, very accurately. I'll show you some pictures now of the sound. Okay, so these shots are taken more or less from Plymouth Hoe, a little spot called Rusty Anchor, and that is Mount Edgecombe in the distance there, and you can see that Girardet captured the shape of it quite well. There's an island in the sound called, um, it's St Nicholas Island, but it's commonly known as Drake's Island. And then out at the mouth of the sound is the breakwater that was actually under construction um, when Napoleon was here. It was actually being built, ironically, by French and American prisoners of war. Um, there's the island, Drake's Island again. And that's another shot, a uh, bit more magnified, of Mount Edgecombe. The island again. Um, it's, I would have thought, fairly sensible not to place the Bellerophon too close to that island, um, simply because it would have been a good viewing platform for people to row out to there. Um, and this, to give you an idea, as you're probably not familiar with what Plymouth Hoe looks like. Um, this is a map from 1859, which is the earliest I could get. Um, and it shows the sound. You can see Drake's Island in the centre there. The large white um, area on the left of the picture is basically an area known as Kremel and then Mount Edgecombe as well is that whole landmass there. So the clips that I just showed you um, were basically looking in that kind of direction. I was that's the, the base of that arrow is on the hoe, and it's pointing across past Drake's Island at Mount Edgecombe. And um, there's there are lots of things that intrigue me, sort of puzzle me about this. That um, first of all, did did Girardet ever visit Plymouth? How did he know what Mount Edgecombe looked like? Because he's done a pretty good job of representing it. But I, I, as far as I know, he was French. Uh, well, he was um, Swiss Huguenot uh, by birth, but he, he lived in France all his life. So did he ever visit Plymouth? I don't know. I haven't found that out yet. And I have read lots of conflicting accounts of where Napoleon uh, and the, on the Bellerophon was actually situated during this period. Um, when, when I first moved down to Plymouth in 1988, there was a, a place, a sort of local history um, 
museum stroke tourist attraction on the hoe called the dome and they had a they had a room dedicated to this uh event in in this museum and they quite categorically stated that the Bellerophon was anchored in Corsan Bay. Now, um, Corsan Bay isn't even on this map. It's just about um, within the definition of Plymouth Sound. If you, if you travel around Mount Edgecombe, going west off this map along the coast, Corsan is a little um, fishing village, uh, along the coast and the reason it was a useful anchoring point was that um, during the Napoleonic Wars the French were being blockaded in ports so in, there was a French Navy in Brest and the English Navy maintained a station off of Brest um, in the hope that they'd come out and give battle and um, Occasionally, the, the wind would be unfavourable and the British Navy wouldn't be able to maintain this blockade um, and they would come back across the channel and anchor in Plymouth Sound until the weather was favourable again. And rather than sail all the way up um, the Tamar into the naval dockyard, which you can see at the top, top left of the picture there, um, they would anchor in Corsan Bay, and as soon as the wind changed, they could be in their ships and back around to um, blockade the French coast. And that was made easy for them by the fact that um, where that narrow strip of water um, that you can see between um, Plymouth and Mount Edgecombe is, there, there was a ferry service that um, that runs nowadays. Uh, there, there was a jetty known as Admiral's Hard and the captains and admirals would come down to this jetty, get on a boat, be rowed across to Mount Edgecombe and then there is an old carriageway that goes right way around the coast um, that would take them very rapidly to their ships. So this is what Admiral's Hard looks like today, um, still much as it would have appeared in the 19th century and at the bottom of that lane is a jetty uh, this is it leads right out there's a ferry there to give you an idea um, short trip across the river tamar and in the distance there is mount edgecombe and this is uh, what the carriageway looks like nowadays it's called the earl's drive it was started in 1740 but it's ideal to get the naval commanders round to corsan which you can just glimpse in the distance there and that's a shaky view of the breakwater zoomed in on the breakwater from Corsand. So you can see that Corsand is just about technically within Plymouth Sound, but it's it's sort of pushing the definition of Plymouth Sound a little bit. And when I was filming, um, very conveniently, there was a small tanker anchored in Corsand Bay, which um, to my eye looked about the right size um, to match a... Uh, 74 gun ship of the mine so um this will give you an idea there we go so did the bellerophon anchor in that spot well up until recently i would have said yes but I, I was so taken with this um impression that i got from the uh plymouth dome all those years ago and it made perfect sense because um it, it would have been a good place for the uh, Bellerophon to stay away from the crowds in Plymouth and um, to get away quickly. Um, and, and the place had this history as being a, 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 a naval anchoring spot. But um, the, more I, the more accounts I read, uh, the less I am inclined to believe that now. The main problems are that um, there are lots of lots of accounts of people viewing the Bellerophon um, through telescopes from both 
Mount Edgecombe and the Hoe, and you can't see Call Sand Bay from the Hoe, um, so that contradicts um, the account. Um, and also, a lot of these people who flocked out in boats were taken there um, um, but from the Barbican by people um, offering their rowing boats and skips and so on, um, who, who were based in the Barbican, and, and that is a long, long way to, to row. So I, I don't think it was that far out in, in Corsan Bay. But I've also read an, another um, conflicting account again that the Bellerophon was anchored in Jennycliff Bay. And Jennycliff Bay is that area in the bottom right of this map. Um, and again, that's, that's feasible, but you, you wouldn't be able to make um, Napoleon out um, very well, even through a telescope from Mount Edgecombe. From the hoe, yes, but not from not from Mount Edgecombe. I'll, I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so this is the view from Mount Edgecombe. That's Drake's Island again, looking across the Sound, and Jenny Cliff just appearing there. Um, so it's the area below where those aerials are, and it's quite a distance. It's not you wouldn't go to Mount Edgecombe to get a good view of the Bellerophon. If it was in Jennycliff Bay. And then coming up is a, a view from uh, the hoe there. And um, just again, take a mental note of what the coastline looks like in that in that direction. And I'm going to show you another painting of the same event. So this is a painting by an artist called John James Shallon, and uh, it shows the Bellerophon Moraes in the centre of the picture there against the backdrop of Jennycliff. Um, and this was painted in 1816, so much closer to the time. But again, I, d I don't know whether Shallon actually visited Plymouth and how he got... Um, how he so accurately portrayed the um, eastern side of Plymouth Sound. But this view looks to me as though um, the viewpoint is low down on the hoe um, rather than high up on the hoe looking down on Jenny Cliff. It, it looks as though it's almost at sea level and um, looking in the direction of Jenny Cliff, which would be like this. And it may just be a coincidence, but um, if you look at both pictures, um, that last bit painting I showed you um, showed the Bellerophon side on. So you're looking at the starboard side and Girardet's painting is looking at its stern, looking towards Mount Edgecombe. So in both cases, the alignment of the, the ship is um, similar like this. So this is the sort of Girardet perspective, looking at the stern with Mount Edgecombe in the distance. And um, it may just be pure coincidence, but the, the Chalon painting shows the, the ship pointing in the same direction, but, look, but looking from that angle with Jennycliff in the, in the background. Now, I mean, maybe in 1890, there was still some kind of folk memory that uh, Giraudet tapped into, but uh, oh, it, it may just be pure coincidence. But uh, I, I've sort of, my preferred spot for the Bellerophon to be anchored now is somewhere around here. It's um, not that far from uh, the Barbican, which is sort of immediately north of where that that ship is on on the top of the map there it's a long way from drake drake's island um the Jennycliff area isn't that easy to get to um admittedly it is quite close to the coast so uh, you would expect 
spectators to crowd there. And the only thing it hasn't got going for it is that um, it's a long way from Mount Edgecombe. So I don't understand the accounts of people standing on Mount Edgecombe to view Napoleon. Um, but whichever whichever account you take, there's going to be some kind of conflict in it. Um, so there we are. That's that's my theory about where the, the lower front actually was anchored. And of course, it is possible that the um, Bellerophon up anchored and moved around the sound. Um, it was there for about a week and a half anyway, um, arrived on Wednesday the 26th and didn't leave the sound with Napoleon on board until Friday the 4th of August. So what exactly is going on here? Um, why the attempts to keep Napoleon from view? Why the secrecy? Um, what what is the big fuss about? Uh, and why is he such a hot potato for Maitland to handle? The, during the Napoleonic Wars, um, Napoleon had been ridiculed by the British press and portrayed, uh, particularly the cartoons of him by famous cartoonists like Gilray portray him as a little stunted uh, character, comical character. But in fact, he wasn't that short for the standards of his age. I think he was five foot five, five foot six. Um, most people at that time were about that height uh, because nutrition wasn't as good as it is nowadays. People didn't grow at all. And... Napoleon was actually taller than Nelson, who is never presented as being Admiral Shorty or anything like that. Um, so there was a deliberate attempt to demean Napoleon, um, and that isn't actually the impression that he gave in life. Not only did he have um, a very kind of strong stature and bearing but he had immense charisma um, he was able to uh, manipulate people um, and his for he had such a forceful strong character um, he, that he had an aura around him that um, was uh, potentially a problem for the British because um, he he soon was winning over characters on board the Bellerophon um, who were and that was a potential problem because there there were fears that he would attempt to escape and this sympathy for him wasn't just on board the ship um, there was a great deal of sympathy for Napoleon and for republicanism in the country at large as well. Um, we, I mean, nowadays we tend we tend to think of the Napoleonic Wars in a similar kind of light to the Second World War, which um, took place obviously more recently. Um, but I think I think it's important to kind of not compare Napoleon with Hitler, even though historians tend to do that and the popular press still still does do that that uh, it presents England as and Britain as standing up to the continental tyrants such as Napoleon and such as Hitler but they were two entirely different kinds of people and um, Napoleon's uh, regime in France has left an enduring legacy of legal reform, social reform, um, political reorganisation that the French still um, ap appreciate. And uh, he, he basically swept away the Ancien Régime of France and replaced it with a modern state. And these crowds who were flocking to see him weren't there to jeer or to mock him. They were cheering him and applauding him. And the, the, there were descriptions of the 
waters around the Bellerophon being like solid land. There was such a crowd of people in boats um, that the crew of the Bellerophon um, had difficulty keeping them at the uh, regulated distance. Um, Maitland had orders that they weren't to come within about 100 yards of the ship and he had to have um, cutters going around, circling around the Bellerophon and um, driving themselves into the surrounding boats and forcibly keeping them at, at a distance. But it goes far beyond just the, uh, a feeling of sympathy towards Napoleon. There was a very serious political issue here as well. During the English Civil War, uh, Plymouth had been besieged um, by the Royalists and it never fell to the Royalists. It remained a parliamentary um, city right the way through the war and after um, the restoration of the monarchy in 1660 um, this citadel was placed on the hoe and um, it, there is nothing suspicious about its design it's a it's a completely standard Vauban style citadel but the feeling of Plymouthians has always been that it was placed there to um, terrorise the city um, and that guns were pointed towards the city as well as out to sea, but in a star-shaped uh, plan, that's inevitable. But it does, it does symbolise for Plymouthians um, their kind of subservience to the, the crown. This is the view over the city. You can see it really does dominate and although in 1815, this is 155 years after the restoration of the monarchy, um, I would suggest that it's, it's perfectly possible for feelings to still be running strongly in 1815. Um, I mean, compare that to America, where we're in a very similar um, time gap now in 2015 to the American Civil War in the 1860s and um, just look at the um, the way feelings still run high over there so um, I, I think that's some a factor that you have to take into account that um, there would have been a great deal of Republican sentiment within the city and of course not just in the city but in the the country at large, um, George the Third was still um, the king, but he had he was mad by this stage. Um, and in 1810, his son, um, also called George, had assumed the regency of the kingdom, and um, he eventually became king on George the Third's death in 1820, um, and was crowned George the Fourth, but that particular monarch was um, a notorious, uh, debauched um, ruler who had little um, links or, or um, sympathy with his, his populace. Um, so he was a very unpopular ruler. And here you have in the right smack bang in the middle of Plymouth Sound, um, the complete op opposite, uh, a man of great um, charisma and adored not only by his own people and armies, but by a great many um, people in in Britain. I mean, there are still people today who um, have a great regard for Napoleon, despite um, he did have failures in his character as well. But um, there is no doubt that he was... Uh, a great um, person from history. When Napoleon um, returned from his first exile on Elba, he had a, a handful of men, his sort of personal guard that um, started with him and uh, he was able to um, turn all the armies that were sent against him 
um, and they joined his side so that that was how he um, was restored and uh, that's that's how he got into power again and the hundred days took place that led up to the Battle of Waterloo and um, there must have been a, 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 a fear in the hearts of uh, the, the Admiralty that um, he was capable of doing that to the crews on board uh, the Bellerophon and other ships in the, in the Royal Navy. In 1797 there had been mutinies in the fleet um, they weren't political protests they were they were more like more akin to strikes um, to demand better conditions um, but they were taken very seriously nevertheless there was a mutiny at Spithead and another at the Nore um, and there was a mutiny on board uh, the a frigate called the Hermione in the West Indies um, and there was also um, problems in Plymouth in the same year. Uh, there were th three Marines based at Stonehouse Barracks who attempted to incite mutiny. And they were executed by a firing squad not far from this citadel on, on the Hoe. Embedded into the pathway on, on the Hoe is... Um, a cross with the number three on it and uh, that's often um, reported to be the site of the execution um, but that is probably um, another one of these misconceptions in the same way as um, Glamovians believe that the cannons pointing into town were, were placed there to terrify them um, this cross was probably put there in 1812 um, when the mayor, George Bellamy, um, who incidentally crops up in this story again later, um, was was um, in dispute with the um, army authorities over where the citadel's um, domain ended and the town's uh, precinct began. So cross, he, we, the theory is that crosses were placed marking the boundaries of the citadel all the way around the citadel and they were numbered and this is the only one that happens to survive and it, it's number three and that is just a coincidence that it happens to be the number of people that were executed on the Ho in, in 1797. But nevertheless, the, the fact that that story has lingered in the minds of Plymouthians is indicative of their sympathies. And I mentioned um, earlier that the breakwater had been or was being constructed with the use of French and American prisoners of war. Well, um, in 1809, Dartmoor Prison was constructed um, and it housed something like six and a half thousand American prisoners alone, um, who in 1815 were awaiting repatriation. Um, Britain and America had signed a peace treaty, the Treaty of Ghent, and these Americans grew impatient at um, the delays in repatriating them and there was a disturbance at one point and the um, army authorities um, fired into the crowd and a large number of Americans were, were killed and uh, you only have to think about that there was a ready-made army for Napoleon to take over if he wished. There, there were French prisoners, American prisoners, and the, the crews of the, the British naval ships were, there was a very high contingent of French and American sailors on, on board those, as well as a, a multitude of Irish sailors, and Ireland as well had uh, in recent memory fought um, an unsuccessful uh, campaign to to throw off British rule that, that was in 1797 or 1798 
So there were a lot of men under arms um, who potentially could have been turned to Napoleon's cause in exactly the same way that a lot of French soldiers returned to his cause in, in 1815 in March. And you'll notice on that uh, painting by Chalon that I showed you earlier that the Bellerophon is um, escorted by two other Royal Naval ships. They're, they're both frigates. One's called the Liffey and the other the Eurotus. And were those ships there to help fend off the adoring crowds or were they there to keep an eye on the crew of the Bellerophon itself? Um, because they were slightly removed from the potential source of excitement and um, Napoleon's presence himself. And uh, they might well have been there to um, turn their guns on the Bellerophon if it did show signs of um, slipping away with Napoleon in, in, in control. Now, I've already mentioned about this business about... Napoleon's status was he a captured head of state or was he simply a captured general um, and his ambition having failed to get to America seems to have been to request asylum in Britain and he's supposed to have written a personal letter to the Prince Regent asking to be given um, somewhere to stay in in the country and the Prince Regent ignored that letter but the fact that he was able to make that communication is interesting it's in its own right it means he, he was able to correspond um, and people were prepared to deliver his letters and also there's a, a very interesting remark made in the brochure that's that is on sale at the exhibition that I mentioned earlier it's it's called Napoleon in Plymouth Sound and it's written by Quentin Bond Spear and he refers to um, the fact that Napoleon was partly kept on board the Bellerophon and um, refused uh, permission to, to go ashore um, so that he remained under the jurisdiction of the Admiralty and he, he makes this um, interesting comment that um, the High Court Constable was attempting to serve a writ of habeas corpus on uh, Lord Keith who was the officer responsible for Napoleon's um, custody um, but but that surely means that somebody ashore had taken out that writ um, so there were there was clearly an effort to assist Napoleon um, legally so that he could he could uh, persevere with this uh, case of being allowed to settle in Britain um, and that indicates a great deal of sympathy for him ashore as well. Had Napoleon not surrendered to the British, I, I don't think there's any doubt that um, if he'd fallen into the hands of the Prussian army, for instance, or even uh, been captured by the monarchist French, he would have been executed. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, but the British found them in this kind of constitutional uh, flux because they had to observe the processes of law. Um, but at the same time, in order to deal with the problem of what to do with Napoleon, they, they, they were obliged to act illegally. And this is an issue that hasn't really been um, aired by British historians. Uh, the, 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 the standard take on the whole subject is that he surrendered, Napoleon surrendered to the British 
and spent some time on, in Plymouth Sound and was then sent into another exile on St Helena. But of course, he wasn't exiled uh, because he was removed to an island that was within British sovereignty, under British sovereignty. So he was actually effectively held captive on British territory, albeit in the middle of the South Atlantic, thousands of miles from any kind of assistance. And this issue of his status also lingered on even after his death. He died in 1821 and was uh, buried on the island to begin with of St Helena and uh, the the gravestone was a simple slab that was placed over his grave and it had no inscription on it because he wanted to have the inscription Emperor of France and the British weren't prepared to agree to that so he had an unmarked grave um, and it was only in 1840 that the British uh, came to an agreement with the French and returned his body and of course he's now interred in um, a magnificent tomb in Les Invalides in Paris which was his uh, dying wish to be buried amongst the people that he loved. So this is something that really has almost been covered up that uh, St Helena was the equivalent of our Guantanamo Bay in a way, only it was a prison for one rather than for hundreds, but um, legally it, it could be challenged. And of course the, the, the French notion that the British had uh, bumped Napoleon off by poisoning him with arsenic um, it is shown in a new light when you consider that he was illegally um, imprisoned as well and that was an embarrassment for the government and they were probably anxious to rid themselves of this embarrassing problem. Now if you remember I said earlier that the um, captain of the Bellerophon Maitland had uh, strict orders to keep the crowds at a distance from the ship and um, he used quite uh, brutal methods to do that. Um, the, the whole situation was a health and safety nightmare because you had hundreds and hundreds of people uh, bobbing about in small boats in, on deep water and uh, sadly one person was uh, um, drowned. Uh, a lot of people fell out of their boats and, and managed to clamber back in but one person didn't and drowned and he was um, a mason working in the dockyard um, and he's the this is a, a record of the church burials at Stoke Damerel Church which is the principal church for the dockyard area um, and the second name down, John Boynes, 35 year old, living in Cherry Garden Street in the dock. Um, that's his record. There's actually a photograph in the um, exhibition at the museum of his gravestone. And um, I'm pretty sure this is the same photograph. I, I acquired this one off of... Uh, a very useful website called Find a Grave, um, which is good for tracing monumental inscriptions um, if you're interested in family history. And um, I went looking around Stoke Damerel Churchyard to see if I could find this myself. Um, just to give you an idea, it's uh, a very large area. There's a, there are sort of three or four separate walled enclosures. Um, and during the Blitz, most of that area was completely flattened. So all the gravestones, or the majority of them, have been used as paving. Um, they're all laid flat and laid out in paths. Um, but of course, as it's on a hillside as well, or on a slight slope, 
um, those gravestones are not the most suitable surface for a pavement and there have clearly been some accidents by, with people slipping on them and they've um, fenced a lot of them off. So um, there, is, there are large areas which are kind of overgrown now with brambles and, and aren't terribly and there are warning signs telling you to keep away, um, which I ignored because I was trying to find a gravestone such as this, which is clearly up against the wall. Um, and I don't think this is the actual site of John Boyne's grave. I'm sure this gravestone must have been moved um, from the central area where it had been pushed over by bomb blasts and so on and placed up against a wall because it was of... Um, interest and uh, the walls as well are really overgrown with ivy and brambles and uh, not pristine as this photograph would suggest although this was taken in 2012 and I made two trips to the graveyard in an attempt to find this and couldn't. I found a grave that looked very similar so I got quite excited thinking it was this, dated from the same period. It also had um, Freemasonry symbol, symbols on it, as this one does. Um, John Boynes was clearly a, a member of the Freemasons, um, uh, as his, his profession would have led you to believe anyway. Um, but anyway, to cut a long story short, I couldn't find it, and the graveyard was a bit of a, a hazard area. There wasn't just it wasn't just overgrown; it was full of um, uh, beer cans and signs of drug abuse and so on. And uh, I conceded defeat in the end and gave up looking for it and just grabbed this image off of Find Your Graves website. But the thing I really wanted to say about this um, sad incident is the Freemasonry aspect. Um, Freemasonry was regarded with a great deal of suspicion um, at the end of the 18th century um, because it was uh, a sort of semi-secret organisation and a lot of um, free-thinking, middle-class, um, reforming-minded uh, people were members of it. So it kind of acted as a, a framework for revolutionary activity and um, you're probably aware of the uh, fact that a great many founding fathers of the American Revolution belong to the Freemasonry um, Society, and uh, there's even there are even Freemason masonry sy symbols on the um, American bank banknotes, such as the eye in the pyramid and so on. Um, so it it does make you wonder whether um, poor old John Boynes had um, more than a passing interest in Napoleon's presence in the, in the sound, and he had um, fervent uh, revolutionary beliefs himself. Okay, now, I've already mentioned Lord Keith um, and the attempts of the High Court constable to serve a writ of habeas corpus on him. Um, Lord Keith was the admiral of the Channel Fleet. So he was um, actually on board his flagship in the Hamoes, which you can see on the sort of mid left of the picture there, which was the area off of the naval dockyard. So it's where um, most of the naval ships would would anchor um, and he was on this flagship um, called the Ville de Paris uh, which was a first-rate vessel of the line it had 110 guns um, and our story now moves to um, his actions so he was trying to keep one step ahead of the constable so that the constable couldn't serve this writ of habeas corpus on him, whilst at the same time just trying to bide time 
until he received instructions from the Admiralty on how to proceed. This, this is the same map that I showed you earlier, only zoomed right out. So to give you an idea, the circle there um, is enclosing more or less the area of Plymouth Hoe. So the Sound, Drake's Island, the Bellerophon and the Polian are all off the bottom of this map. So Napoleon had arrived in the Sound on the Wednesday, uh, which was the 26th. And finally, on Sunday, the 30th of July, um, Lord Keith received his instructions from the Admiralty. And these were delivered by no less a person than Major General Sir Henry Bunbury, who was the Under Secretary of State for War. He came down to Plymouth personally, and it was now a matter of um, finding a convenient location um, to hold a Council of War to discuss these instructions. So this really gives you an impression of the pressure that Lord Keith was under, um, because they had to pick a, a nice secluded spot out of town um, where the constable wouldn't interrupt them and where there wouldn't be any prying ears or eyes um, or anyone interested who might be plotting to um, rescue Napoleon or anything like that. So they opted for a house that belonged to a relative of Lord Keith's. Um, he was um, a captain in the Royal Navy by the name of Thomas Elphingstone and he lived in a house about two miles away from the dock, out right on the north of the map here where the arrow is pointing, and the house was called Bel Air House. Now that in itself is interesting because um, the name Bel Air is also used for this house which is in Dulwich in South London and um, it's either built by or in the style of Robert Adams, who was a very um, prestigious architect of the period, very fashionable. And the house in London still exists. It's a very nice wedding venue nowadays, so I'm sure they won't mind me um, giving them a little bit of advertising. But the house that we're interested in in Plymouth, of the same name, um, unfortunately isn't there any longer. It was demolished in 1908 and replaced by houses. The name has been preserved in the name of this road, which is smack bang on the site of the house by my reckoning. And as you can see, these houses were constructed soon after the demolition of Bel Air House itself. And there's also the name Elphingstone Road, which is the road that Bel Air Road leads into. And Elphingstone, of course, was the name of the Royal Naval Captain who owned the house, who was a relative of Lord Keith. Um, that boundary stone is dated 1891. Um, but if you look on this map again, there is a BS um, in the sort of bottom left quarter of the map, which indicates a boundary stone. So whether the 1891 stone replaced that one, I'm not sure, but it's, it's more or less in the same spot. So this is the approximate position of Bel Air Road. And this road here is, is the present Outland Road. Um, now, that area now is, is quite built up. The area to the south is still parkland. Um, it's part of Pounds Park and Central Park. And Pounds House, which you can see on the bottom of the map there, um, doesn't survive. Um, it was replaced in the 1820s by another house, which does still exist. Um, so for instance, this lodge house is still there, um, and that curved road, curved, dr curved drive leading down to Pounds House still exists in that form, as 
do the stables of the old house, which are now a doctor's surgery. So if you look at the shape of the stables there, sort of open rectangle, and this is the restored version, which is now, as I say, a doctor's surgery. And this is the lodge that I pointed out earlier on the corner of the drive with the curved drive looking exactly as it did on that map in 1859. And that is the rebuilt Pounds House, um, which is in a very similar style. Um, I'll show you that a bit more closely shortly. So if you just take another look at the surrounding gardens of Bel Air House. This is no mean dwelling. Um, there's a very nice layout of avenues and gardens there. Um, so it would have been a very pleasant place to live. And um, as I say, the house on the other side of the road, the neighboring house, Pounce House, um, was built very soon after 1815. Um, so I think we can use it as a proxy while I describe what went on inside Bel Air House on the night of the Sunday. So the Council of War was held in secret on the evening of Sunday the 30th of July um, and it was held over dinner so I'm sure it was very congenial um, as well as Lord Keith um, and Sir Henry Bunbury, the Under Secretary. There was also present um, the Commander in Chief of Plymouth's Naval Base, um, who was Admiral Sir John Thomas Duckworth, and also present was Captain Elphinstone. Um, and there was also another Elphinstone there um, called Alexander, who stood guard over the door. Um, supposedly with a drawn sword, um, but um, it's also likely that the building was surrounded by a patrol of marines or something like that to maintain security. And Lord Keith received instructions from the Admiralty that um, Napoleon was to be sent to St Helena, um, packed off out of the way, and he's task then was to organise um, Napoleon's transport which was going to take place in a convoy of ships um, and not on the Bellerophon, the Northumberland was dispatched from Portsmouth um, and it, they, they were tasked with the, um, the duty of transporting Napoleon. Um, but again this aspect of um, the unstable state of uh, Royal Naval crews crept in because the, once the crew and particularly the Marines on board the Northumberland discovered they were going to St Helena there was very nearly another mutiny on that ship. So the Northumberland didn't um, sail all the way into Plymouth Sound. The Bellerophon with Napoleon on it um, left left the sound on the Friday the 4th of August so there was still a little bit of a delay while the convoy was organised and the Bellerophon transferred Napoleon to the Northumberland um, back around in Tor Bay um, and that took place on the 7th of August and Napoleon's fate was sealed from then on. So there we go, the past is a, another country as it said, um, they do things differently there and um, that process I'm sure wouldn't uh, wouldn't happen nowadays or not in the same manner. Um, Napoleon wasn't Hitler, um, he wasn't a war criminal um, and he was he was treated very unfairly. Uh, it's a very odd situation because when he returned from Elba, um, the allies, uh, Prussia, Austria, Russia and Britain, 
didn't declare war on France, they declared war on Napoleon, the person. I, I don't think there's another case in history of, of countries going to war with a single person. Um, but anyway, so that put Lord Keith in a very difficult situation and he, he dealt with the whole situation ex-judicially, -judicial, I think is the correct term to apply. The years following 1815 were a very sad time for Britain. Um, there was a lot of social unrest in the years after the Napoleonic Wars. Um, naval ships were decommissioned um, and sailors laid off. Um, lots of soldiers coming back from the war um, found themselves um, out of work. There were bad harvests, famine, um, the price of corn was um, fixed by corn laws that kept the price high. Um, all sorts of um, clamour for voting reform, um, riots, um, protests, peaceful protests that were put down, such as the Peterloo massacre in Manchester. Um, there was a plot to overthrow the government, uh, the Cato Street Conspiracy. And something that I neglected to mention previously was that uh, three years before 1815 and 1812, um, the only prime minister in British history to be assassinated died. Um, that was Spencer Percival. And you have on the throne, um, you have George IV, who was probably the most unpopular monarch in British history, um, lived a very extravagant, debauched life. He was succeeded by William IV, who um, died uh, childless, so there was no direct succession. Um, and the story was that he was um, infertile because of syphilis that he'd caught whilst um, serving as a officer in the Royal Navy. But somehow Britain avoided revolution in the, in the um, fashion of the French Revolution. It's probably the bloodshed that the French Revolution produced that um, was always in the back of mind of um, the British and stopped them from um, going that distance. But had we thrown up a man of Napoleon's calibre at this time then, who knows what might have happened. Um, but I think, I think in a way that's a reflection of this painting. What, what was um, Girardet attempting to show in the painting, which remember is painted a long time after these events took place. I think he's very good at demonstrating a kind of consternation in the crowd, um, a sort of realisation that the, the, the mob is sort of getting a little bit out of hand, but at the same time the, that you can see people saying, almost saying goodbye to Napoleon um, and goodbye to um, any chance of a uh, reform. It doesn't show the death of John Boynes, but there is this boy being plucked out of the water, so he's clearly demonstrating the dangers that the crowd were put to and put themselves to. And that feature, it's, it's reported as being the guns firing on the crowd, but I mean, I'm certain that didn't actually happen. It's possible that that's the hoses, but it does look like gun smoke. Um, but that would have caused numerous casualties. And there's almost that sense of a struggle going on on, on the gangway there. Um, are they trying to board the ship or are the sailors trying to repel boarders? Um, and as I say, he did capture Mount Edgecombe accurately as well. So there's a mix of realism and fantasy in the painting.
anyway, I, I was mentioning earlier about uh, the mayor of Plymouth in 1812, George Bellamy, who um, was the mayor of the city at the time these crosses were placed around the citadel. And uh, Bellamy has a, a link to this story as well, because he had actually been a surgeon on board the Bellerophon um, in the late 18th century and had been on board her during the uh, famous Battle of the Nile, which was um, another of Nelson's famous naval victories. And the Bellerophon um, was um, eventually used as a prison hulk, so it um, returned to Plymouth and um, became a, a hulk, um, as did a great many other ships. While I was wandering around Stoke Damrall Churchyard, um, trying in vain to find John Boyne's grave, I did come across this grave, which I'll throw in as an interesting um, adjunct. A uh, chap who was shot whilst on duty on the on a prison ship. Um, but anyway, um, Bellamy uh, eventually purchased some timbers from the Bellerophon. Um, it was it had been renamed the Captivity, but it was taken it was towed around to Rotherhithe to be broken up in the 1830s, about 1835. And Bellamy took the opportunity to purchase some of the timbers uh, which he used to build this house um, where he lived in Plimstock. So a little bit of Bellerophon and a reminder of Napoleon has remained in the city. In the 1830s, a great many of these um, famous Napoleonic era sailing ships were broken up. Um, Turner's painting of the Fighting Temeraire is a good example, but I thought just to end, I'd show you this photograph, um, which I've scanned from a book uh, called the Men of HMS Victory at Trafalgar by John D. Clark, and it, this play, this picture breaks my heart. It's um, a picture of the Implacable, um, which was again it was used as a prison hulk in the Sound uh, or in the Hammerways anyway, um, and it survived all the way through until 1949. Um, so within living memory, and this photograph shows. Um, charges being set off um, out in the English Channel against her side in an attempt to sink her um, and that, that that attempt failed and eventually she was rammed by a naval tug um, and turned over capsized and eventually sank um, but the implacable had actually been a captured French ship called the uh, de Guy Truane um, which is why she's flying both the French Tricolor and the um, British Union Jack. So um, even while they were desperately trying to sink her, they did show her some um, respect. But it's a very sad end to any ship, and um, had it survived another 20 years, of course it would have been a heritage piece by now and um, we would have taken great care to restore her. So that's the end of my little tour of Plymouth um, showing you areas related to this exhibition that's still on at the uh, City Museum in Plymouth. If you get a chance to come and see it, it's on until the end of September. And it is, it is a good exhibition. It's, it's um, well worth having a look around and it's free entry. Um, so I'll say goodbye at this point and thank you once again for watching and see you on the next film.